Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Welcome, everybody. My name is Melissa Meza. I'm a senior program manager here with Health Begins. Um, I know some of you are probably wondering where is Eva? Eva's on PTO, and so I will be filling in for her today. Um, welcome to our Northeast Session 5. Next slide, please. Some of you may have already been prompted, but we just wanted to let you all know that this session is being recorded. Uh, recordings can be found in our external shared folder as well as um, on our YouTube. And so if you are interested in going back and reviewing the recording, you can do that. I'm sharing the link to our shared folder now. Next slide, please. And welcome everybody. If you're just joining us, next slide, please. Okay, so just a little bit of light housekeeping before we get started and dive into today's session. Um, if you could all please update your names on Zoom, including the name of your organization. You can also include your pronouns if you'd like. Um, we have a chat icebreaker today, so we would like to know what your favorite summertime activity is. What are you most excited for? Um, I know a lot of you are surrounded by beautiful lakes and um, really nice outdoor settings. So I want to hear from all of you. Please let us know. Um, in the meantime, if you um, have any questions, we are looking forward to a dynamic session. So please feel free to use the chat and raise raise hand function um, as needed for any networking questions and feedback. We'll have a few opportunities for all of you to ask questions, but we do encourage you to use the chat um, as well as unmute wherever needed. Um, and then I'm gonna do one quick plug to ask everyone to turn their cameras on so we can see all of your beautiful faces today. Um, I'm gonna look at the chat really quick. Camping and concerts, hiking. Oh, Gretchen, are you gonna go to Northern California to go hiking, Gretchen? No? Okay. She's she's being a hater right now. It's okay. Um, so camping and concerts, camping trips, fun with my kids in the pool, horseback riding. Ooh, I like that. Floating in the pool, kayaking. Ooh. Amber, I'm still going to come find you for Whiskey Town Lake. Um, camping. Does anybody have any recommendations for camping this summer? You can tell me all of your secret spots, please. So I don't have to do any of my own research. Um, next slide, please. All right, so um, if you are new to the collab, welcome. This is a space for regional Calame stakeholders to collaborate, identify challenges, and problem solve with the goal of improving Calame implementation and driving utilization. Um, so welcome aboard, and please feel free to ask questions. As I mentioned, we did share an external folder where you can find all of our materials from previous sessions as well. Um, and then I will share the link to our PDF deck um, shortly. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm actually going to hand it over to Amber. We do want to share a quick announcement. Um, Amber is actually going to be supporting us as our regional subject matter expert um, on the ground support where needed. Um, and I know a lot of you have already connected with her, but I want to give her an opportunity to introduce herself and share a little bit more about herself. Hi, all. It's wonderful to be with you today and part of the team. Um, I work at Shasta Community Health Center. I'm the senior director of our HOPE program, which is our homeless health care program, and it's also the primary spot where we implement our Calame program. We were a whole person care county, and so we rolled over um, into Calame since the very, very beginning and offer both enhanced care management <clears throat> and um, currently are offering five community supports. So we have short-term post-hospitalization, medical respite, um, housing transition and navigation, housing deposits, and housing sustaining services. Um, just really excited to continue to figure out how we can make this work in our region and um, partner together with everybody. Thank you so much, Amber. And let's all give some kudos to Amber. I know we already did some of that in the chat, but we are really excited to have her joining us for these collaborative sessions. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, I'm gonna run through our session objectives pretty quickly. Um, by the end of this session, participants will receive important DHCS, MCP and peer updates and resources, hear from and build partnerships with local providers. Um, we'll discuss the development of a provider directory and identify next steps for improving regional provider referral coordination efforts. Um, and one exciting announcement is we'll be 
discussing our upcoming in-person session um, and just getting some information from you in, in terms of supporting our planning efforts. Um, all right, next slide, please. Um, for today's agenda, as I mentioned, we have a couple items to cover. We've already gone through our welcome and level setting. We'll be moving into our updates and resource sharing, including DHCS and MCP updates. Um, we'll engage in a quick discussion to get some feedback from you um, that we can share with DHCS. We have a provider spotlight today. We also have um, a few in-person session updates. And then we'll move into uh, another discuss discussion to support our improving referral coordination. Um, this includes strengthening local efforts and then um, discussing a provider directory. By the end of the session, we will close out with next steps, special thanks, and share any resources that we have available. Um, next slide, please. Okay, I'm gonna hand it over to Gretchen now to walk us through part two. Great, thank you, Melissa. Hi, everybody, Gretchen Schroeder, working with Amber and the Health Begins team here on our CPI. So, so happy to have Amber joining us today. Um, we have a couple of different updates for you, and I know there's a lot of budget updates that just came out a couple of weeks ago, and I think we'll have more updates on those um, not so great things in the budget um, in next month's meeting, but um, suffice it to say there were a lot of budget proposals that um, were definitely cutting the healthcare workforce, um, so we'll see what actually sticks when the governor, when, the, when they um, give the budget to the governor um, in mid-June. But besides that, we can talk about what's happening with ECM and community supports. And I think one of the things that we've been talking about, and I think we actually shared this a little bit with you guys last month, is the state is really trying to work on doing a standardized process for ECM referrals and authorization processes. And they've been working on this, oh gosh, for a number of months. We are seeing some drafts come through for review of what maybe a standardized referral form would look like. Um, for ECM. And then and there's been some discussions too. I know the health plan has been part of these as well around what does presumptive authorization look like for ECM? So are there certain groups of folks that may be, you know, very obviously eligible for ECM that perhaps we should just do an automatic enrollment in ECM and have it cover 30 days? So there are some things that are floating out there. As soon as what um, the state releases is finalized, we'll definitely share it with you. But just wanted you to know that things are changing and we will start to see them um, in the next month or two. Next slide, please. All right, so we are back to having some <laughs> wonderful discussions with the state and um, the Health Begins team is gonna be meeting with the state um, in the first week of June. And we want, and they've asked us to gather feedback from all of our CPI participants and to share that with them at our in-person meeting. So we are gonna come talk to you now. You can go to the next slide. So I know you guys have provided feedback um, as recently as March on some of the things the state's been asking about. And they have these wonderful six lovers that are really trying to help them um, look at what's important for ECM, where can they get feedback. So I know you've seen this before and you've given some feedback, but the state has come to us again with some very directed questions about things they could be doing differently. So I want to invite you all to share your feedback, to have your voices be heard um, as we kind of go into the next two slides. So if we go to the next slide, we're going to be looking at streamlining authorizations. And the state is asking about how do we do this around the housing deposits community support. And I think there's two reasons the state is asking this question um, for folks around the state. One is that uh, we know that housing deposits has been significantly underutilized and the state's trying to figure out what are the barriers, what are the challenges that have made this community support so underutilized. So I'd love to you know, talk about that a little bit for folks that are involved in that. And the other thing that I think is coming um, that is very similar to housing deposits is kind of a 15th community support service called transitional rent services. Like all the community supports, it will be optional for the managed care plans to offer, and it will be optional for folks to enroll in. But the potential, what we've heard has been approved by the federal government, is that um, managed care plans could offer up to six months of rent to qualifying individuals. And I think our my assumption is that it's going to be similarly structured to housing deposits, where maybe you pay rent and the managed care plan would 
reimburse the organization who's doing that. So I think there's some similar challenges to housing deposits in this upcoming community support. So based on those two reasons, I think the state wants to know what's happening with housing deposits, what's working, what's not. So I'm gonna ask you all to let us know what's working and what's not with housing deposits. And I don't know if there's anybody out there who's currently doing housing deposits as a community support. Oh, Andrea, do you wanna jump in here? Yeah, hi, good afternoon, everybody. I can um, just speak um, on the app of Visions of the Cross. And um, I would say that in general, if you are a smaller organization that isn't funded um, through various um, you know, revenue streams, that it would be difficult to upfront, to be able to provide that money up front for as many members as you have living in your um, you know, your STPH housing. Yeah. And then additionally, um, there has been quite a delay in payment as well um for the deposits so like i said if you're a smaller organization it could really um you know be detrimental financially so those are my thoughts thank you no thanks andrew and so you are you you're currently a housing deposits provider then it sounds like yes visions of the cross is a um, housing deposits provider correct so a question for you too, and I, I think we're also here in the state's going to be putting some guidance out on very explicitly what can be used for housing deposits. What are the items that qualify? And you know, is that rubber spatula going to be part of that or not? But I'm curious. In addition to the funding challenges with the reimbursement, is there an issue with collecting all of the documentation, receipts, and such to submit to get that housing deposits reimbursement? You know, I would like Toby to speak on that because he oversees that. So, um, Toby, do you want to jump in on that? Can you ask that question again, Gretchen? So I think we've been hearing from other folks, too, that not only is it just the, the cash flow issue with housing deposits, but sometimes the documentation that's required to get that reimbursement can be um, a challenge as well for smaller CBOs. I don't, I don't think the, the documentation is has been an issue for us. We At the very beginning, we had a, a barrier where we weren't putting enough information in, in, the, in the request for the deposits asking or showing why the person, what the person has done to prove that they can sustain the housing. And we came up with a pretty cool outline of questions that we asked them. Oh, great. And when we submitted along with the TAR. But one of the, one of the biggest barriers... We've been pretty fortunate to be able to work with some of these uh, rental property rental agencies around here. Mm -hmm. the, it's not a promise to pay letter. I just send them a letter saying that they're part of our community supports deposit program. And, and luckily, we haven't had any of the deposits denied yet. So they take that almost as a, as a promise to pay and they're willing to hold the home. But with some of the some of the, the private owners that don't go through the property management companies, they're not willing to hold the home for that long. You know, that's that's probably the biggest barrier that I see in the deposits currently. No, that's really helpful to hear. All right, thank you, mm -hmm. Toby and Andrea. Yeah. And I know, Amber, you have your hand up. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree with, with the feedback shared by both Toby and Andrea. And then just kind of like structurally, a couple other things to think through. Um, we have a lack of housing in our state. And we we have an even greater lack of housing for for the folks that we're most likely going to be utilizing this service. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we're looking at it as an underutilization of housing deposits, but it's most likely an oversaturation of a rental market. And so, and you know, if I'm a if I'm a landlord and I can work with citizen A who can pay up front and I don't have to work through HUD and housing deposit and all of this and citizen B who I have to kind of go through those steps. Yeah. Like, so I, I just always want to remind us sometimes there are systems issues yeah. that have nothing to do with like the specific utilization. And then second, um, the way it's set up is really like, so like Andrea was and Toby were saying is if you're a smaller CBO, then you, you may not be able to pay up front or have those relationships with existing landlords. Um, so you might need a larger CBO who can pay up front to be able to like be the one to get the tar for the housing deposits. But the way it's set up is you kind of need to be able to do housing transition and then housing deposits and then housing sustaining services. 
So it's really silos, those three separate services and keeps partners from being able to work together. So for instance, like I could, Visions could do the housing transition, Shouts to Community Health Center could do the housing deposit. And, you know, maybe another agency does the housing sustaining because that links to our skill sets, but the way it's set up right now, that that isn't going to work. That's really helpful. Thank you, Amber, for the feedback. And Arette, I see your hand is up as well. Aretta, can you, are you able to come off mute? I was having that issue earlier today, as everybody knows, so I understand if you are. All right, well, we'll come back to you, Aretta. If you're able to come off mute, great. If not, you can put your, your thoughts in the chat. Oh, yeah, These are all really helpful around housing deposits. I do want to go to the next lever that the state is asking us to get your feedback on. Um, so if you could go to the next slide, please. So, I think we can all agree on this, that we need to strengthen market awareness of what ECM and community sports are, both for the individuals who would benefit from the services, as well as referring partners. And so one of the things I wanted to explore with you guys is what could be done, both at the state level and the local level, to really do a better job. And I'm going to just use marketing as more of a cross term, but how do we market these programs better so folks understand they're for real, that's not a scam, and how do we help referring partners understand what this is, how it could benefit folks they work with, and then also importantly, how do we make the referrals into these two programs? Um, so we'd love to hear your thoughts on how to do that. I know some of the groups I've been working with have thought about using QR codes to help promote self-referrals into some of these programs, which I thought was an interesting idea. I'd be curious once they pilot that to see how it works, um, but we'd love to hear what you think might work both state level policy decisions, as well as at the local level. Do we need to have folks put uh, advertisements up somewhere? Do we need to think about doing more trainings? And I, I think about trainings, I think, you know, we can do a training like, you know, we get on Zoom and we all talk, or we could create a slide deck that could be utilized by groups throughout the community to help, you know, really say, here's what ECM is, here who qualifies, you know, here's what community sports are. So I think trainings could be done in a variety of ways that may be able to reach more people. Andrea, I love it. You know, just my personal opinion is that um, in order to reach this, these populations, you're really going to have to have a hands-on approach um, because, you you know, that's how you're going to be able to um, get across to them um, and help them understand what the benefits are of these programs. Um, and as far as, um, you know, increase awareness for community supports, I think that, um, you know, there's so many um in order to be even be eligible for it, you know, you really have to kind of be specific about how you would increase awareness um, for that, at least. Um, and as far as additional trainings, um, I think like maybe I definitely would agree on like community groups and even also like the county commissioners, you know, maybe like going in on a more, um, you know, county, uh, county level as well. So I think just maybe expanding like that. Awesome. Love these ideas. I think it'd well, be cool, I'm sorry, to train at hospitals as well, too, for ECM, because, you know, often people get discharged, especially like if they're a high utilizer. So being able to refer to um, ECM in that situation and then with pre-release coming on board, definitely getting the local jails and juvenile halls really like familiar with this program as well. Wonderful. I'm going to take Vanessa and then I want to make sure we get to our provider spotlight. So Vanessa, go ahead. You'll be our last comment on this and then folks can put ideas in the chat. We'd love to keep the conversation going there. Thank you so much. I wanted to add to that. I, I do feel like there's a lot of uh, members coming out of the hospital and even primary care offices that um, really have no idea that these are services available to them. And I think that if we strengthen the communication with them, if we provide them some flyers or some sort of information so that they are aware of these programs, I think that would be very beneficial for the, for the members. No, that's wonderful. Great feedback, you guys. Thank you. So yeah, keep putting your ideas in the chat. I love, I love getting all of this. And we will be sharing this with DHCS at the in-person meeting we have with them um, the first week of June. Wonderful. Next slide, please. 
So I'm actually going to see if we can hold off for one quick minute on our plan update. So I hope that's okay, Ashley, because I know we only have our provider spotlight. I think he's only available for a short period of time. So I want to make sure we take advantage of him and then I'll come back to the plan updates after that. Next slide, please. So now we have our provider spotlight. Next slide. And we are really excited. We have um, asked Dr. Kyle Patton to join us today to talk about the HOPE program and all of the work he is doing to um, engage with our unsheltered population. Um, and I'm just going to turn it over because I know, Kyle, that you only have a few minutes, so I want to capitalize on that time. So I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Gretchen. Can you guys hear me okay? Good. I was having microphone issues earlier. Um, yeah, thanks. For, thank you for having me. Um, Amber, uh, Amber thinks I can't talk about anything street medicine related for only 15 minutes. So, you know, you have me for a short window. We may be here a while, though. That's uh, just knowing myself and how I get when when I'm talking about about street medicine. Um, so I'm Dr. Kyle Patton. I'm the medical director of our our Hope Department here at Shasta Community Health Center in Reading. Um, I'm also a street medicine provider. I've been doing street medicine now for the past uh, 15 years or so. I can see you all doing the math, right? Like how old is he? Um, so I'm definitely not an expert in ECM. Uh, that's Amber's department. Um, but, uh, I do have a lot of experience in, uh, practicing street medicine, in building street medicine programs, uh, implementing, uh, that as a care delivery model within healthcare generally. Um, and so we've, uh, been fortunate enough here at Shasta Community to really build out our ECM, um, program and implement ECM within our healthcare for the homeless um, department and our regular um, street and mobile practice. And we found that to be very um, a very nice pairing. And we've found it to really be impactful in regards to outcomes for our uh, unsheltered and patients experiencing homelessness. So I'll talk a little bit about that today. I want to leave a lot of room for questions for you guys. So I'm going to try to kind of cruise through the slides. That way you guys, um, we have some time uh, at the end um, to kind of discuss some of it. Uh, next slide, please. Keep going. So just a little bit about myself. So I'm from Salt Lake City in Utah. I uh, actually got into homeless services and started doing homeless outreach before I got into medicine. So that's me, a, a clean cut version of myself. Um, back in uh, 2010, uh, after I graduated uh, with my undergraduate degree from the University of Utah, um, at which time I started practicing homeless outreach for a nonprofit there in the city. And then I was paired with these two guys who were medical providers. Uh, one was a full-time PA, medical PA, and then the other was a psychiatric nurse practitioner, um, both of whom were doing street outreach for the FQHC there in Salt Lake City. And so as part of my job, uh, I would uh, go out on the street with them a couple half days every week. Um, we would drive around in this maroon homeless outreach van and would uh, contact um, patients that were living on the street there in Salt Lake. Um, I would take them around to patients that I was aware of that would need their services. Um, and then they would provide that there right there at the camp or wherever we're seeing the patient. So that was really my first exposure to uh, street medicine. I, I was fortunate enough to have it that way versus the other way around because uh, I was able to um, have exposure to homelessness and what our patients go through before I even stepped foot in the door uh, of the hospital or of my med school. You know, it was it was good to have it that way because then at each level of my training. Um, I was able to see medicine through that lens of homelessness, um, not personally, but through like my experience as an outreach worker and could see the ways in which we do meet the needs for our patient patients, but mainly the ways in which we don't. Uh, next slide. So this is kind of a nice sort of intro into um, my talk, I, I tend to share this uh, when I'm giving presentations. This is a quote by Jim Withers, who's uh, a, a, an influential street medicine doc uh, within our field. 
Uh, and he uh, coined this phrase, reality-based healthcare. And he says, I believe it is time that we define and develop the concept of reality-based healthcare. Regardless of the patient or population group, we must learn the skills that will allow us to meet patients where they are and understand the forces that challenge and support their well-being. We can practice healthcare with many and varied motivations. These include incentives for reimbursement, fear of liability, and our own preferences and prejudices. If we are to be relevant to those we serve, we must begin soon to work with the reality in which they live and die. We need to explore the reality of those for whom the system is not working. The street homeless happen to be excellent teachers in this particular area. I really like that because it's a it's a, a patient first, right? We talk in healthcare about a patient-centered medical home, patient-centered models. We we kick that phrase around a lot, but how you know, do we really mean it when we say that, right? Because we're going to practice medicine within the system that we have. And we're going to do it this way because we know that this is the way to do it most efficiently. This is the way that we provide care. And the reality is, in most instances, we're getting the patients to come into our system and operate the way that we've decided versus the other way around. And street medicine turns that model on its head. And we say, hey, listen, we're going to create a healthcare delivery model that recognizes the realities that our patients are facing. And that's actually going to work for them within the context of their homelessness. And so we're not tied to a specific way of doing things. Obviously, we're practicing medicine with, um, we want to practice it in a way that has good quality, that's safe, that's evidence-based. But at the same time, in regards to like the actual healthcare delivery model itself, we're going to do things differently and we're going to do it in a way that our patients feel like uh, meets their needs. Next slide. So, um, you know, our patients, I could go on for a long time about um, the health impacts of homelessness. That's kind of a talk for another day. Um, but there's this idea within our chronic rough sleepers, our unsheltered homeless of trimorbidity, right? When you talk comorbidity, that's two diseases that tend to co-occur. This idea of like high blood pressure tends to go along with like diabetes, other metabolic disorders. Our, our chronic unsheltered rough sleepers, they, um, they tend to deal with this idea of trimorbidity, which is chronic medical disease, psychiatric illness, um, substance use. And you can see where our chronic rough sleepers or chronically homeless sort of lie in the center of that Venn diagram. That really is consistent with what you guys are trying to do with an ECM in reaching these special populations, right? So if if you had to take all those various um, kind of descriptive terms that um, that defines ECM and who you're trying to reach, and the easiest way to do that would would be to say, hey, we're just going to focus on our unsheltered homeless because they do um, they do check a lot of the boxes in regards to what I think ECM was designed to to. To do. Next slide. So dynamics of homelessness, right? Um, our patients tend to like ping across various institutions and treatment settings. Um, and this is one of the reasons why our patients, um, you know, like the prior slide showed, they deal with high rates, high rates of uh, disease, uh, early mortality, um, but at the same time, when we're trying to help these folks, um, it can be challenging because our institutions and our treatment programs um, tend to be siloed across various settings. And our patients tend to ping across those. Um, you know, you may have a patient that, you know, you, I'm contacting on the street. Um, we're starting to build rapport, providing them with some degree of care. And then all of a sudden they end up in the hospital they get discharged back to the street, but we're not aware of that. They end up back in the ER because they didn't pick up their medications or have any follow-up. Um, back to the streets, they may be in the shelter for a short period of time. Then they get arrested. They're utilizing services there. You know, there's no kind of like one person that's saying, hey, let's like move across these systems and let's be intentional about maintaining continuity with this person. And so street medicine, even though we lead with the streets, um, it really is about creating a safety net and a model where we're able to be flexible and move fluidly across these various systems. Um, next slide, please. 
Okay, so just briefly, what is street medicine? So street medicine is the direct provision of healthcare to people experiencing homelessness uh, wherever they live. Like we don't we don't put limits on where we're able to provide care. Um, that being said, as long as it's like a safe right like setting, you know. Um, so that could be under bridges, alleyways, green space, motels. Um, you know, I've gone down into culverts. I've gone into um, tunnels. Um, we go wherever the patients are and wherever, wherever the, the need is. Um, and that's really this model of like outreach first, right? So we're there to provide care. I'm a physician, like that's my role. Um, but I'm not going to put any limits on, on where that, that medicine is being delivered or where, uh, the practice setting is going to be, uh, street medicine, street medicine is more than that though. Philosophically, it's a multidisciplinary healthcare delivery model an approach that is focused on outreach engagement, full scope care in various settings, complex care coordination and harm reduction. Uh, it prioritizes the most vulnerable, vulnerable, so are chronically homeless, like on that Venn diagram, kind of right in the center there. Um, and then there's also, you know, just as we don't put like parameters on where we're seeing the patient, we also don't put parameters on like the time, right? So, um, you know, the goal initially is with outreach and engagement. And if it takes me three months, four months, six months, 12 months of me just shooting the breeze with the patient, convincing them I'm a cool enough guy worth talking to, then we're going to do that. We're going to invest relationally so that eventually down the road, um, when they do have something come up, whether it's a, a mass in their breast or a new wound in their leg, or they just got out of the hospital, they feel comfortable enough with us that they can come to us um, or they can bring it up to us when we see them out at the camps. So it really is just trying to be fluid in your practice setting in your relationships with patients, not setting a timeline or having an agenda when you're um, seeing people on the streets. And then letting the streets be your guide. So um, really the streets are informing our practice as much as we're providing care and educating our patients on the street. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, right, so I kind of created this picture of like, we're very fluid, you know, in street medicine. Um, we're not brick and mortar. We don't have a regular patient schedule. Um, I always tell the residents that I work with, like if clinic, if, if primary care in the clinic is classical music, we are jazz, right? So like we're very fluid, but at the same time, there is a structure is, and, and especially I think when you're talking with our administrative folks and the people that like, um, are in charge of running our programs, like we need to be able to like communicate to them that there is a structure to work. Center. Um, so the various kind of bubbles at the top um, involve uh, our various practice sites, how we deliver healthcare, um, the middle bubbles are our scope of practice, and then the bubbles underneath are kind of secondary things that we do, whether that's resident education, or working uh, with the hospital on healthcare systems and utilization, um, patient advocacy, working with our community, um, letting them know how we feel about like encampment sweeps, all of those kind of different secondary goals. So up at the top, we've got street outreach. Um, I'm the main provider that does that. I do that two days a week. Um, I'm also the provider that runs our post-hospitalization, our medical respite program. That's a 20 bed program. Uh, we run that in two different ways. We've got a group home setting with our partner agency, Pathways to Housing. And then we also operate a scattered site model where we put people in motels that aren't necessarily appropriate for that group home um, environment. Um, we run our fixed sites. Um, I call those our fixed sites because those are places where the patients then need to come to us. Um, so that's our mobile van as well as our shelter-based clinic, which is actually embedded within the shelter, uh, our emergency shelter here locally. We're very clear, um, you know, there's, there's um, a lot of buzz these days about street medicine, now that there's like some funding, now that California is really wanting um, a lot of health centers to co contract with their managed care organizations uh, to do street medicine. We are very clear that we do mobile vans 
and we do street medicine and they are not the same, right? So when I go out on street, uh, doing street outreach, it's with a backpack, it's with all of um, my supplies, which I carry. I drive around a sprinter van and have like basic need items that I hand out. Um, but then our, our big mobile van, we're parking that out to a, a site. We have a regular schedule for that. And then the patients are then coming to us. Um, the scope of practice is pretty much the same. Like I can do most everything on the street that I do on our big mobile van. Um, so there's not a huge like delineation practice wise, but I think just from like a philosophy standpoint, um, some of us that are more purists, we would, you know, we, we like to make that kind of delineation between the two. Um, we also do housing and case management. Um, we are contracted to do ECM. Um, and yeah, we offer medical, um, psychiatry. We have a full-time psychiatric nurse practitioner that staffs our various sites. And then we do harm reduction in, uh, medication assisted therapy. Next slide, please. Um, I don't need to get into this a lot. I mean, I really just wanted to, I think we can kind of talk about this and if you guys have questions, um, I'm happy to answer them, but this really, I really just wanted to show that ECM and street medicine are such a nice and natural pairing um, because some of those things that I talked about in the earlier slides, as far as like care coordination, um, meeting, our, meeting our patients where they're at, um, building delivery models that can meet their needs as far as like their complex medical, psychiatric, social issues, I mean, I think a lot of that is what ECM was intended to provide. Um, and, um, you know, it's a similar philosophy as to what we've been trying to do within street medicine. Um, so, you know, I think, um, you know, there's there's now some newer folks doing ECM, right? So now that ECM has created kind of a, a viable and more sustainable model for providing these services, there are uh, a lot of new players. We've kind of seen that locally. There's people that are now doing ECM uh, that weren't doing it previously. And I think for those people contracting with the street medicine or having some sort of MOU with a street medicine team can really help inform their practice and help them um, grow as an ECM provider in really being able to like have the skills to uh, meet our patients' needs, knowing that those tend to be uh, fairly complex. So in 2022, Department of Healthcare Services, they did say to all managed care uh, organizations across the state that they should contract with their health centers locally um, that are doing street medicine. Um, if there uh, wasn't a health center that was doing street medicine in any given county, they needed to provide some funding to help those health centers uh, get a street medicine program off the ground. Um, we have a contract here with Partnership Health to be able to do that. Uh, we did receive some seed money to help kind of build out our program further since we are already doing that. Um, but it's it's very much an exciting time within California uh, in regards to street medicine. Um, and I think, you know, here within, you know, five, 10 years, um, street medicine can become like a very commonplace and um, regular part of how we practice medicine here in the state. Next slide, please. So, you know, when you talk about kind of the philosophy of street medicine, it really is similar to what, what you guys are trying to do with an ECM. Um, I think ECM was, was created to really shore up the safety net to be able to provide more robust care for those that had complex health needs. And street medicine has been doing that now um, in different ways across the country for some time now. So um, I think, you know, for us, like having ECM, like building out ECM within our department, it didn't really seem like this big thing that we were implementing. Amber may kind of disagree with that since she did most of the work. Um, but it, it's, it didn't seem like a big task because it was already something that we were doing both philosophically and in practice. And it really was just kind of building that out and formalizing it and then adding it as a supplement within our department. 
So, you know, stream medicine teams have always utilized like case management. We've relied heavily on that community health workers, outreach workers. Um, and so, you know, some of these things that are, are big pillars of ECM, like they philosophically stream medicine providers tend to be very comfortable with that and want all of those pieces within our street medicine programs to be able to be effective in impacting our patients' health outcomes. So you can just see how some of these values like align between street medicine and ECM, like this focus on outreach and engagement. Um, and that's not outreach in regards to like getting people enrolled in, you know, like, um, like insurance coverage. That's outreach and like going out to the camps and having a presence out there, building trust. We call that a pre-treatment process, you know, before you can even get to the, the, you know, talking to them about their treatment, there needs to be that component of trust. And so, you know, 30% of what I do is medicine and 70% is just um, convincing patients that I'm okay to talk to, like I have some street cred. So um, that's a, a big piece of what I think we do in street medicine, what I think um, our case managers do that are, are doing ECM. Uh, comprehensive and multidisciplinary services with integration of care teams, continuity of care, patient advocacy, navigation, community partnerships, trauma-informed, culturally competent, and harm reduction focused. So, you know, you could put up this slide, you could like put a hand over ECM values and just have it street medicine values. You could put a hand over street medicine and just have ECM values. I think in regards to like how we're practicing and how we're trying to help our patients. Philosophically, we're very aligned and it's kind of one and the same. This was a patient of mine. Um, his name's Greg. Uh, he's given me uh, very kindly permission to share his story. Um, he's a big supporter of what we do. I met him out at, out at camp um, and he had a, a, a mass on his nose. Um, that was large enough that like I was concerned for a, a skin cancer and biopsied it, confirmed that it was in fact that, um, and then um, referred him to a der dermatologist, our um, closest dermatologist um, that accepts partnership is about an hour away from here in Red Bluff. Um, and so we arranged for medical transport. Um, He's also got some pretty serious mental illness and, and wasn't able to meet the uh, his transportation down to that appointment. And then there was a camp clean out, an encampment sweep, and then we subsequently lost him to follow up. Um, maybe six months later, he resurfaced and that mass had grown significantly, um, had invaded through his uh, into his nasal cavity, his right um, sinus, uh, maxillary sinus cavity and then was blocking his lacrimal duct which is a little kind of channel that drains fluid from the eye um and so it was you know we were um naturally concerned about that and we're really at the point where we um knew it was going to take some really kind of complex uh, care coordination to be able to get him the care that he needed so that was kind of the time where we were also implementing ECM and really trying to build out like close collaboration with our case managers. Um, thankfully, we are all in the same office. We talk about patients regularly. Patients they're case managing are often the patients that I'm managing on the street or within our various fixed sites. Um, and so this was an example, you know, we were able to get him off the street into a motel through medical respite. We we're able to maintain him in a motel through community supports. We got him connected. Um, to um, another nonprofit that does transitional and then ultimately permanent supportive housing. All the while, he's being case managed through our department um, and he's getting care for his cancer. He got like 12 weeks of external beam radiation. We got him down to UC Davis to see the specialty surgeon down there. They ultimately removed the mass as well as his nose. Um, he had some residual cancer, so he had to do some follow-up treatment, a follow-up surgery. So this was really involved. This wasn't just going to be like, hey, we're seeing this guy on the street and we're like, you know, it's going to be an, an easy thing. This was a really heavy, excuse me, a really heavy lift for our department. Um, and we needed like kind of that sort of village approach. 
not to mention he also has, you know, um, significant psychiatric symptoms. And so our nurse practitioner was really involved with that. So it really was kind of the first moment where we said, hey, this, we need to like formalize our multidisciplinary way of doing things. We started having meetings as a team. You know, we still have those weekly where we talk about high risk patients. So, you know, it, it, that's a good example of how um, we were um, able to implement ECM in a way that really was then able to be impactful for our patients. And it kind of happened just because we had our expertise within, you know, from doing street medicine, our case managers worked closely with us and we had close collaboration and then we were able to operationalize and kind of formalize that. Nice success next, story. Next slide. Actually, I think that's it. Yeah, that was wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Pat. Yeah, you're very welcome. We do have just a couple minutes for questions, so I would love to open that up for anybody who wants to ask <clears throat> Dr. Patton any questions about, especially about how street medicine and integrates with ECM and how you all can work together. Vanessa, I see your hand up. I can't tell if your hand is up for a question here or if it's left over from an earlier period. I'm sorry, I think it's left over. Let me go okay, ahead. That's fine. <laughs> Didn't want to ignore you. I just have a comment. I don't have a question because he sits across from me, so I can <laughs> I can ask him at any point in time. But um, I just, Dr. Patton, you have talked about like the partnership also between street rest, uh, street medicine and medical respite, and how that can be like another safety net for patients. And so I didn't know if you wanted to add a couple words since that's a community support as well. Yeah, it's kind of been this this. Um it's, it's this weird sort of, I don't want to say schism because I don't think it's really intentional, but it, it, it's sort of within the healthcare for the homeless world, it's sort of become either you do medical respite or you do street medicine and never the two should mix. You know, there are some programs like um, Jim O'Connell's program in Boston where they offer medical respite um, and they offer street medicine. They have some fixed sites. Um, so our program is, is kind of, is similar in its structure to what they do there in Boston, not necessarily in like, like the, the resources that we have, but at least in how we've kind of structured that program. So it is interesting. Like I've, I've never really understood that why, like, you know, they do street medicine, but they also don't do med respite. And then they're having to refer or, you know, having to figure out sort of like warm handoffs from med respite to the streets. For us, it's it's always, I think, been a real strength of our program that we have both under the same roof. And medical respite is mainly intended to be a post-hospitalization program, but we use it as like a hospital prevention program. If I see someone on the street that has complex health needs and they've got some acute issues, then I'm going to get them off the street. I'm going to put them in medical respite and we're going to use more intensive medical resources and interventions to keep them out of the hospital and manage their various chronic illnesses. So um, I think that's, that's something that I've, I've um, I'm happy that we were able to include both within the structure of our, our department and, and our program, because I think just like street medicine and ECM are, are closely aligned um, and a natural pairing, I think street medicine and medical respite are as well. No, that's wonderful. Well, Dr. Patton, thank you so much for your time. This was a really great presentation. Appreciate you coming on to share with us what you do. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. All right. Take care. Right, bye. bye. So we have about nine minutes left before we jump into office hours. And I want to make sure that we capitalize on those nine minutes. So I'm going to actually offer Ashley a couple minutes for any health plan updates she wants to share, and then we'll quickly move on through the rest of our topics. Hi, thank you, Gretchen. I will not take a ton of time. I only have a few updates to share with you. Um, so the first one being that we sent an updated attestation survey to our ECM providers. Uh, so just a reminder, if you have not completed that, to please get that into us. A little bit of a background on that. 
Um, we are trying to more align our data that we send to DHCS. So um, if you have members in those counties, but we didn't have capacity survey results, we're hoping to align that with the attestation. So even if you're not taking referrals in those counties, if you have members that do um, reside in counties other than the ones you've previously attested, make sure you're also attesting to those as well. Uh, Another reminder, our ECM roundtable registration links have been updated in the last, I believe, two months. Um, so definitely make sure you are using the new registration link for those. Our next one is going to be June 20th. And then for the community support provider roundtable, it was previously scheduled for tomorrow, but they pushed it out uh, due to a conflict. So the new one is going to be May 30th. Um, of next week, and it's going to be from 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock a.m., and I believe that is it for partnership. Thank you so much, Ashley. That was great. Absolutely. All right. Oh, Toby, you have a question? We're going to get a, a new link to the new community supports roundtable. Yeah, let me find it and I'll drop it in the chat. Thank you. Great, right. thank you. Any other questions for Ashley before she drops? Or not drops, but puts herself on mute again. <laughs> okay, great. Anybody else have any other announcements they'd like to share with the group? All right, then I'm gonna keep us moving. Melissa, I'll turn it over to you for a brief overview of our in-person. Yeah, so um, I dropped the link to office hours. We are meeting directly after the session um, and we can cover a little bit more and as well as build on conversations we're having today. But I really wanted to highlight our upcoming in-person session. Um, Shasta Community Health Center is actually going to be hosting our team um, on Monday, June 24th from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Um, we know that that is a three-hour block. We know you are all busy. And so I just want to highlight that the last 45, 30 to 45 minutes will be more for office hours and any of you who want to stick around for networking. Um, we are planning on doing a second session in Lassen, Modoc, and or Siskiyou counties. I know some of you um, are not in the Shasta region, and so we will be coming to you. Just want to highlight that you're welcome to come to both, but I know travel can be a little bit hard. Um, we will share out the flyer, but I also dropped it in the chat for anybody who wants to register now. We really encourage you to start registering now, um, but I'm going to go and hand it back to Gretchen so that she can maybe close this out. <laughs> I'm gonna actually do one quick thing before we do a close out and move to office hours. I wanted to give the floor to Amber. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please, or maybe two slides from now. Did you wanna do the poll, Melissa, or do you wanna save that for office hours? I think we can do it in office hours. Okay, perfect. So I'm gonna turn it over to Amber then. Hi, y'all. Um, I'll do this as brief as possible. Um, so when on um, last month's feedback, we had the one we had selected as a group was creating a provider directory. Um, and the one I've been uh, playing around with in my head is uh, specific to community supports, but I think it could also work for ECM as well too. And I know that we have folks in various different areas of implementation in our in our group. So I kind of want to talk about it from both lenses. For a larger area, for like Shasta County, where we have a lot of different folks um, doing a lot of different community supports and ECMs, I feel like a brochure that we give patients that really calls out or give individuals, sorry, not patients, that calls out like the programs that offer the service and what their specialty is. Um, and what that, you know, like a, just a brief synopsis of the program could really support one of the values of ECM, that it's a voluntary program and that patients get to choose like who's going to be the best match. I think it'll also help us as programs be able to lean into our skill set and be able to partner well together and, and also know what other providers are, are doing in our area. And then for our folks that are not as fully implemented, or maybe in a frontier county, being able to have a brochure, I think, is also a really powerful tool when you're writing grants or working with your um, kind of your community partners about um, 
ways that they can join and partner with you and also talking with your leadership about just kind of systemic gaps that you have. And so you can't fully implement if you're lacking in all these areas. So I think there's a win for both of it, depending on where we're at. And I think it could be really simple, right? Like it's like our name, our specialty, what we offer and who to contact. I don't think it has to be a really in-depth project, but it could really help us um, coordinate care better and also identify gaps better. Wonderful. Well, to build off of that, I would love to talk about doing a provider directory that maybe could be utilized as part of the brochure. So if you want to go to the next slide. So after hearing about, um, you know, kind of the first step we could take to try to help improve and strengthen referral coordination, um, we did create, we actually, we talked to a lot of different facilitators and providers, like what would work for, um, a provider directory and we came up with a template which we like to you know roll out to see if it's going to work or not um and i know i'd love to spend time going over it but we are we have two minutes left so what i'm going to do is i'm going to actually have um melissa be you can just quickly put it on the screen so folks can see what it looks like so we have just a form to fill out this is totally optional for everybody but it may help inform future efforts i like the idea amber brought up as a brochure so this could be part of the brochure um, but it would allow folks who opt in to share their organization, if you are an ECM or community supports provider, which counties you work in, um, and then also if you're an ECM, what population of focus um, you serve, and if you're in community supports, which CS services you're doing. And then if you opt in, you can also choose to share your organization's referral contact, so people do want to make referrals and connect with you. Um, that could be tracked as well. And so I think the next step in my mind would be if folks can fill this out, that would be wonderful. We can share what it could look like at our next CPI meeting when we meet in June in person. Um, and then we can opt to see how, how much we want to use this for other purposes. So we will put that link in the chat. I saw Melissa already dropped it in there for me. So I encourage you all to look at it. If we're missing information that should be in there, please let us know. Um, we can, this is an iterative process, so we can continue to update this as needed. All right, I have one minute left. Melissa, what do you want me to do in that one minute before we uh, get off? Encourage oh. all of you to join us for office hours in case you want to weigh in on this provider directory. We would love to continue the conversation and make changes if possible. Um, I also can provide more details about our in-person session. We wanted to hear from you um, to see if you have topics that you want us to add to the agenda. We want to create the agenda with you in mind and so welcome you to join us in office hours. Um, we'll transition over there now. Thank you so much.